I think that the music in hell for eternal would be some of this rock music. Police are very reluctant to investigate these crimes as satanic crimes, Barbara, because communities quite naturally don't want their reputation stigmatized as being the home of the devil. Dungeons and Dragons is a real serious problem. We'll take a break. When kids kill kids, did the devil make them do it? Studies have linked violent behavior to the game. Satanic worship, ritual sacrifice, and even... In the 1980s, a widespread and irrational panic began to spread across America, and soon enough, it was covered by major news outlets across the world. The words, satanic panic, echoed throughout homes during the evening news, and this unsubstantiated outrage was only made worse by the headlines seen on tabloid magazine covers at supermarket checkout stands. It was everywhere in the 80s and 90s. The reports told stories of devil-worshipping cults performing occult rituals in secret ceremonies all across the United States, and news anchors instructed viewers to look out for those wearing all black, listening to heavy metal music, and to be especially wary of those playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, as it was a lure to the dark side, and were sure signs they might be Satan worshippers. Basically, it was a whole bunch of stinky rubbish. To make matters even worse, police departments reinforced this narrative, going so far as to distribute training tapes on what to look out for to members of law enforcement. This phenomenon and its impact on society has endured to this day in many minds and has influenced current shows like Stranger Things, specifically in the depiction of a newer main character on the show. Eddie Munson. Eddie has long hair, listens to bands like Metallica, and plays Dungeons and Dragons with his gaming group, the Hellfire Club. Made up of members of Hawkins High School, including core Stranger Things cast members, Lucas, Dustin, Mike, and Erica. After some mysterious deaths start to plague Hawkins, Eddie is made the scapegoat for the crimes by the locals. Why? Because he's different. The small town conservative mindset of Hawkins rallies against him solely because he is different. The townsfolk are swept up in the 1980s satanic panic. Anyone who grew up in a smaller rural town understands this. That sort of narrow thinking is especially prominent in areas like that, where if the wind blows in a different direction, townsfolk run for cover. But what if I told you Eddie was based on a real story, a real person? Tonight, we're discussing the real Eddie Munson. Tonight, we're talking about the case of Damien Eccles and the West Memphis Three, and the Robin Hood Hills murders. In the early evening hours of May 5th, 1993, eight-year-olds Stevie Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore were playing in their neighborhood in West Memphis, Arkansas. Multiple eyewitnesses reported seeing Terry Hobbs, Stevie Branch's stepfather, instructing the boys to be home around 6.30 p.m. This would be the last time all three boys would be seen alive. By around 8 p.m., when Christopher Byers had still not returned home, his father, John Mark Byers, called the West Memphis Police Department, who began investigating the area, looking for the kids. A short time later, a distraught Byers began frantically searching a wooded area nearby where the boys often played, known as Robin Hood Hills. This area was a densely wooded place near the boys' homes where kids often played, much to the dismay of their parents. It is important to note that this area is also adjacent to one of the busiest highways in America and a truck stop, making it a deceptively dangerous area for kids to be left unattended. Literally hundreds, if not thousands of people stopped nearby each day from all areas of the country. As the light began to fade away and give rise to the darkness of the cold West Memphis night, the police would decide to wait until morning to conduct a full search for the missing children. Visibility in the densely wooded area was low, and it became dangerous to explore the area under those conditions at night. Despite an exhaustive search once the sun came up, led by investigator Gary Gitchell, which began early that next morning, no sign of the boys could be found. Sometime around 1.30 p.m., though, while searching Robin Hood Hills, juvenile patrol officer Steve Jones saw something floating in the water. It later turned out to be a shoe as he peered down the steep banks of a water-filled ditch in the woods of Robin Hood Hills. He could sense something was wrong here, and he called for backup. He radioed for help, and Detective Mike Allen soon arrived to investigate. While attempting to grab the shoe, Allen fell into the water and began searching on his hands and knees. And in doing so, he ended up dislodging something that had been concealed under the water. 
the sunken, carefully concealed body of Michael Moore. Soon after, the two other missing children, Stevie Branch and Christopher Byers, were discovered. All three had been murdered in Robin Hood Hills. West Memphis had a killer on the loose, and it wouldn't be long before police had arrested someone for the crimes. These crimes are particularly grisly and awful, so I won't go into much detail here, but if you do go searching, just a fair warning, this was truly a heinous, heinous crime and understandably elicited a huge emotional response from the public, both locally and nationally, due to the monstrosity and inhumanity of the crime. Damien Eccles, who was 18 at the time of his arrest for the murders, was already on the radar of local law enforcement, but mostly for being a nonconformist in a mostly conservative, religious, small community. He had had his share of troubles with the law, for sure. Trouble that eventually landed him in a juvenile facility. But was it really enough to make him a murderer? Damien, along with his friend Jason Baldwin, were known for some petty, minor offenses. Things like vandalism and shoplifting. But I would argue that a lot of teenagers would fall into some degree of criminality for those same offenses. His most serious crime up to that point was being arrested a year or so prior to the murders for breaking into an abandoned trailer in the nearby Lakeshore Estates with his then-girlfriend, Deanna Holcomb. The two had plans to run away together, to escape the mundane misery that was their small, conservative, religious hometown for a bigger city like Memphis. But eventually, Damien ended up in a juvenile detention facility after the break-in resulted in an arrest. But was behavior like this enough to warrant being a suspect in a triple murder? Almost certainly not. But it did put him on the radar of local law enforcement. Specifically, a 53-year-old former cargo pilot turned local juvenile enforcement and probation officer named Jerry Driver, who was absolutely convinced that the forces of Satan ran rampant in Arkansas, and it was his job to stop it. He was fully swept up in the mania of the satanic panic, and it had made him paranoid and fearful of kids like Damien, whom he believed to be a practitioner of occult devil worship after some run-ins with the teenager in his role as a juvenile officer. An example of Driver's absolute obsession with the notion of devil cults run amok comes from the book Blood of Innocence and a local paper, The Commercial Appeal, where Driver is described as literally driving around on full moons with his partner Steve Jones to find and stop Satanists and cults conducting rituals in the woods, and in spots like aqueducts, in the light of the full moon in 1992, but especially that entire summer. He's quoted in Blood of Innocence as saying, Well, we went everywhere in the world that summer. Every time there was a witch of Sabbath, we were out in force. And whether that did any good or not, I don't know. But to my knowledge, nothing happened that summer. Jerry Driver was an actual law enforcement official in West Memphis. In this obsession, Driver would continue pounding the drum of guilt towards Damien's direction throughout the entire investigation, convinced he was the leader of a satanic cult, eventually making Damien the prime suspect in the eyes of police, who were desperate for someone to pin these crimes on. This fit the narrative of a cult performing some sort of sacrifice in their small town. This was the only way they could seem to rationalize this crime. Damien, to his credit, fully admits he was a troubled kid at this time, no doubt, being diagnosed with depression, among other things. But imagine what most of us are like as teenagers, especially those of us who are considered outcasts. His most visible crimes, in this investigator's opinion, mostly consisted of listening to heavy metal, wearing all black, and essentially just kind of being a goth kid who could be obnoxious towards adults. He was a spooky kid who scared the conservative religious folks around him. And in a town like West Memphis, Arkansas, that was enough to hang you in the court of public opinion, or at the very least, make you a suspect. Jason Baldwin's crime was merely being close friends with Damien Eccles, and similarly, as someone who didn't fit the mold of their small town. Like Damien, he had long hair, listened to bands like Metallica, and liked to draw, for which he was rather talented. But artists weren't exactly the most respected bunch in West Memphis, Arkansas. Simply by being friends with Damien and a little bit different, he also fell under suspicion of law enforcement after they began to focus their efforts on Damien Eccles. Since they now believed, thanks to folks like Jerry Driver, that Damien led a satanic cult in West Memphis. And unfortunately for Jason, a satanic cult needed cult members, and Jason was lumped into this mess. 
He was only 16 at the time of his arrest. And finally, we had 17-year-old Jesse Miss Kelly, an acquaintance of both Eccles and Baldwin's from school. He was known as being quick to anger and having a reputation as a fighter. This short temper often put him at odds with local authorities, which also put Jesse under the eye of the investigators. Jesse, although capable enough in his daily life, also had a reported IQ of about 72. Or in other words, Jesse had an intellectual disability. As we are about to see, this would become central in the West Memphis Police Department's case, as they would manipulate Jesse into giving what I believe to be a coerced or false confession. Based on the evidence I have seen, this confession would become critical to the prosecution's case against all three teens and was the cornerstone for the state's entire case against them. Essentially, everything else against the teenagers was either circumstantial or a matter of opinion rather than fact. Shows like Geraldo in 2020 painted all three teens as devil-worshipping Satanists, both during and after the trials. And in the court of public opinion, sensationalized this for nothing more than primetime ratings at the expense of any semblance of fair trials. The teens, under arrest thanks to Jesse's confession, were dubbed the West Memphis Three. But how strong was Jesse's confession? The investigation into Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miss Kelly is a remarkably flawed one and seems to be, as I mentioned, centered around the confession of Jesse Miss Kelly. In the near 12-hour interrogation session against Miss Kelly, investigators pushed and pushed until they were finally able to break Jesse down, only putting to tape the conversations with him near the end of each session. We then do not know what was said or techniques used to manipulate a teenager with an IQ of 72. We do know a polygraph examination was administered by Bill Durham, a detective on the West Memphis Police Force, with him saying Jesse was, quote, lying his ass off when Jesse denied involvement with the murders. I will note here, through a later examination on the polygraph results conducted by Warren Holmes, a polygraph expert who has worked with both the FBI and CIA and worked on hundreds, if not thousands of murder cases, concluded that Detective Dorham did not correctly interpret the results of the polygraph exam stating under oath that his opinions of the test results were, Well, they were different from the other examiner. He indicated he thought there was deception in the points in the graphs where the pertinent test questions were asked. I evaluated the charts and I have come up with just the contrary opinion. I didn't feel that at the point where the pertinent test questions were asked that the defendant was deceptive in nature. During the interrogation, police detectives Gary Gitchell and Brian Ridge continually led Jesse by the hand after Jesse broke, asking him leading questions like, quote, uh, all right, you told me earlier it was around seven or eight. What time was it? When Jesse had initially told them the crime took place at 9 a.m., then around noon, then the afternoon, and finally, 7 or 8 p.m., continually pushing the murders back to a time more fitting the police theories. Jesse had even told them that the young boys had skipped school to accommodate Jesse's earlier statement that would put them on the scene which they had not, as school records and witness statements show. And even with Jesse's disability, I am certain he could tell the difference between morning and night. The narrative was molded by investigators to better fit the crime. Another important point altered was that Jesse told the investigators they had used rope to tie up the victims, which was not true. The perpetrators of the crime had used shoelaces. Finally, Jesse could not even correctly identify the actual cause of death for the victims, going so far as to incorrectly recount events leading up to their deaths and cause. If he was present, pieces of information he certainly would have known. Detectives led Jesse down a path that would provide them with the answers needed to fit their narrative. If you have time, listen to Jesse's entire confession as it goes all over the place, takes place over multiple recordings, and it is quite obvious to see Detective Gitchell and Ridge leading him down certain paths and manipulating him. Keep in mind as well, he was there in police custody for nearly 12 hours in total, and only a fraction of that was recorded. We have no record of what was discussed off tape. Within hours of this confession, Jesse would recant all of his statements, which were given under extremely hostile conditions and without an attorney present. This confession would damn not only Jesse and Miss Kelly, but also Damian Eccles and Jason Baldwin, 
who were implicated as part of the fictional ghoulish satanic cult narrative constructed by the West Memphis Police Department. Richard Offshe, a professor of sociology at the University of California who was brought in by the defense during the trial, called Jesse's confession a classic example of police coercion. And going even further to call Jesse's admission of guilt the stupidest fucking confession I've ever seen. It is my belief that the prosecution and police department then pushed for Jesse's trial to be set before Damien and Jason's as a deliberate tactic to influence the jury pool pre-trial. If Jesse was set to go first in court, this confession, carefully constructed, would be public knowledge before the two other teens could be tried. A prime example of this jury tampering is that of the jury foreman on Eccles and Baldwin's trial, Kent Arnold. He went so far as to attempt to rally his fellow jurors during the trial to vote guilty, saying his mind was made up long before and the teen should be convicted of the crime without hearing any more from either side. All of this based on what I believe to be a false confession. Around the same time the boys went missing, but before a murder was known, Vicki Hutchinson was stealing from her employer elsewhere in West Memphis. She was then at the West Memphis Police Department the following day, being questioned about the theft, with her son Aaron in tow, who was friends with the then missing children when police were notified that the bodies of the missing children had been discovered in Robin Hood Hills. Aaron then stated he had witnessed the murders to officers and delivered what were wildly inconsistent stories about devil worship and satanic cults to the officers. Aaron, now an adult, has said he doesn't know whether or not what he said was true or just a youthful imagination, along with suggestive leading for details by police officers to craft the narrative they wanted. It all seems like a story to him now, and being so young at the time, he can hardly remember the details. In 2004, he would tell the Arkansas Times, quote, They messed with my words a lot. Reports vary after this, but most seem to agree that on the condition that no charges were filed against her, and with a possible reward given, Vicky was given permission by Officer Donald Bray to, quote, go undercover and see if she could help unravel what the West Memphis Police Department were convinced was a satanic devil cult operating in their tiny village. About a week later, once police had narrowed the crosshairs on Damien Eccles, Vicky, who was neighbors with Jesse Miss Kelly, under the instruction of Officer Bray, did meet Eccles through Miss Kelly, but nothing came of it. She would later tell officers that Eccles and Miss Kelly took her to an SBAT, or witches meeting in the woods, and that all the cult ceremonies were in fact true. This would confirm the police department's theory about a satanic cult operating right under their noses the entire time. But it was a total fabrication, a complete lie. Hutchison, would later recant her testimony, saying that Jerry Driver and Officer Bray constructed the entire story with her saying, quote, It was like this. I was either gonna say exactly what they needed or else. She would go on to say that Officer Bray would tell her, We're going to make this easy on you, Victoria, and you're just going to say exactly what we need or things can get rough on you. You could be implicated in this murder. You could lose your son. The state's entire case was based on a false confession of a disabled teenager, corroborated by a lying witness and strictly circumstantial evidence. No DNA, no legitimate eyewitnesses to place the teens at the scene of the crime. A parade of quote unquote experts on the occult were brought in to seal the teens' fates, and the jurors caught up in the sensationalized satanic panic rendered verdicts. All three were found guilty of murder, with Damien, the alleged cult mastermind, sentenced to death and there they would languish in prison for years, until... And we've got evidence that uh, even in the last two, three years that we believe will exonerate these kids, and we're just asking, we're, we're doing this kind of thing now just to bring uh, notoriety back to the case and, and really impress upon the Arkansas State Supreme Court that we, we get a, a fair trial and a, and a good careful look 
this case that has been so carefully prepared. Largely in part to a 1996 documentary series called Paradise Lost, which followed the case, worldwide attention was brought to the West Memphis Three. Rock stars and celebrities like Metallica, Henry Rollins, Peter Jackson, the Dixie Chicks, and of course, Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam lended support and financial backing so that things like proper DNA testing could be provided to the teens who remained incarcerated into adulthood and provide them what I believe to be a fair trial with adequate defense. It is incredibly important to remember the trio were from extraordinarily impoverished backgrounds, and even through the best efforts of the defenders assigned to them in their first trials, they simply lacked the basic resources to go against an entire system that was determined to railroad them into convictions. The police department and prosecutors were so determined to get a conviction, it simply didn't matter to them who got hurt in the process. Based on the tireless efforts of so many over the years, a deal was eventually struck between the state and the three men who were still locked away in prison. And so it was that in 2011, after 18 years in jail and after appeal after appeal, the West Memphis Three, now in their mid-30s, accepted what is known as an Alford plea, an extremely rare plea that essentially means the defendants plead guilty to an offense while maintaining their innocence and were released from prison after spending half their lives behind bars. The state finally conceding something but refusing to admit they may have been wrong. Lots of theories and speculation about what really happened in Robin Hood Hills have popped up over the years. Everything from a police report from around the time of the boys' disappearances indicating a man covered in blood entered a nearby Bojangles restaurant and was never found, to John Mark Byers' bizarre behavior after his stepson's murder to DNA from a hair found on the victims linking stepfather Terry Hobbs and his friend David Jacoby to the actual crime scene for which he was eventually questioned. It is clear that this case asks a lot of questions but doesn't provide us with a lot of answers and has sparked incredible amounts of debate. This is an especially tragic story, not only for Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miss Kelly, but for the three murdered children, Stevie Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore, who I believe have yet to receive justice. The impact of this case is still felt today, a decade after the West Memphis Three were released from prison, with the recent news that a judge denied advanced DNA testing to allow the trio a chance to clear their names for good. For Damien Eccles specifically, his legacy has endured being the inspiration for a character you might have seen on screen and never even known his connection to, Eddie Munson. Speaking to Deadline, the Duffer Brothers, creators of Stranger Things, had this to say, quote, when you talk about satanic panic, Damien Eccles was not 80s, but we thought he was caught up in something very similar. This mass hysteria, Obviously, Damien is alive now, but this is a tragic story we've been obsessed with. I think we saw the HBO documentary Paradise Lost. We were in high school when we first caught those. And then of course, we saw West of Memphis. It seemed like a really great character and a means to explore satanic panic. And that's why that character kind of had tragedy etched all over him." End quote. Damien has responded on Twitter to the Duffers, and at the very least, maybe this will breathe new life into the story of the West Memphis Three as a cautionary tale of the satanic panic and what can happen as a result of mass hysteria and the true danger in not accepting what we don't understand.